Smoke from New York. I'm Aaron Brown. Would you like some water? No, I was just uh, thinking there for a moment who I was. <laughs> he has a hard time catching his breath when that happens. In the news at this hour, the presidential candidates trade shots on the economy. Americans believe taxes will go up no matter who's in the White House next year. And Dagwood gets a pink slip. Coming up later in this half hour, sports and weather, a daily trot down the campaign trail, and an ode to a lost hero. All that coming up. Aaron starts us off. I think I'm ready now. It stopped in Oklahoma and Georgia yesterday. President Bush warned of the economic dangers of a Bill Clinton administration. The president first took his message to the farm community of Enid, Oklahoma, where he walked down the streets in a scene reminiscent of a small town parade. Later on in suburban Atlanta, Mr. Bush took aim at Bill Clinton's economic views. My opponent and his advisors can trace their intellectual roots to the social engineering ideas popular at the turn of the century. The Clinton campaign quickly counterattacked, saying the further the president falls behind in the polls, the stranger the rhetoric gets. Clinton was campaigning in Denver yesterday, where he said he could do better than the president on the economy. In this week's Time magazine, an administration official is quoted anonymously as saying, well, it doesn't matter what's in our plan because he doesn't plan to follow through on it anyway. And with the cancellation of next week's scheduled debate in Michigan between Clinton and the president, the, de the Democrat rather now says he will hold a televised town meeting instead. Lisa. Well, there's turmoil in the markets, in governments now. Even the comic strip seems nothing is sacred anymore. When last we checked on Dagwood Bumstead, he left his job to work in Blondie's catering business. She's a new woman. On Sunday, though, Dagwood will be fired. To make matters worse, it's Blondie who's doing the firing. She says he's eating up all the profits, literally. The writer of the comic strip is unperturbed. He says Dagwood's been fired hundreds of times. It's as easy for him to, as falling asleep on the couch. So. Well, from uh, Bumstead to Bummer, and I do believe that's the first time we've ever used the word bummer on the air. <laughs> no, it's not. I, it's not? No. Well, it's the second time then. In any case, the weather here. Uh, first cold front of the season. Why that is a bummer will descend across the plains in the Midwest today. Thunderstorms will advance the front. A double bummer, I guess. The East Coast will have one more day of hot, humid, and stagnant air. Make that a triple bummer. The West will have some of the best weather in the country, warm and pleasant. Reflecting the cold front, a huge drop, monumental drop in the national temperature index, 796 it is. Get a sweater. Here's the forecast, and Etna, it's volcanic. Weather brought to you by Radio Shack. In sports this half hour, the baseballs used in next month's World Series will be strikingly, we like that strikingly, different in appearance than those used in the past. The balls will now have more room for autographs because they'll not bear the commissioner's signature. Mm. With Faye Vincent's resignation last week, there's simply no one in the office qualified to sign the balls. Well, that $5 million chess match between Bobby Fischer and Boris Spassky resumes tomorrow in Yugoslavia, with Fischer ahead four games to two. And while to most of us, 15 FE, 16 AV, CB 17, NE 4, BC 7 is clearly a winning strategy, there is a handful, a smattering really, of people out there who aren't quite sure. Because of that, some time ago, ABC's grandmaster of news and other things, Nightline's Ted Koppel, tried to clarify things. We've added some scores. The target on both sides is the enemy king, who ironically is one of the weakest and most vulnerable pieces, able to move only one square at a time. The queen, on the other hand, is the most powerful chess piece, slashing along straight lines or diagonals, capable of controlling nearly half the 64 squares on the chessboard. For years, psychiatrists have debated the hidden meaning of chess's omnipotent queen and impotent king. The pawn is the foot soldier of chess, the only piece never allowed to retreat. Salvation lies in crossing no man's land to the other end of the board, where the pawn can become almost anything it wants to be. And that 
is anything but a pawn. As the smoke clears, the rooks are rolled into battle, attacking in straight lines and working as a team. The rooks are more powerful than a queen because they can protect each other and thus attack with impunity. It would take too long to explain how or why the knight moves as it does. Suffice it to say, it is the only piece in chess that can leap obstacles and make 90 degree turns in midair. Bishops in medieval times were often a power behind the throne, and that is as good a reason as any for their presence on the chessboard. Each side has two bishops, which travel diagonally, one on white squares, the other on black squares. As a result, while their paths frequently cross, the two bishops will never touch. The object of the game is to checkmate the king. To check means to attack. The mate comes when the king can do nothing to block the attack or escape from it. You could liken it to a football game where instead of scoring touchdowns, the object is to surround and demolish the opposing quarterback. While chess is less violent, the agony of defeat is sometimes unbearable. And the history of the game is filled with the cases of great players, some of them world champions, who very simply lost their minds. Ooh, <laughs> glad he said that, not me. Um, which one was played by John Cleese in the movie? That's sports for this half hour. And coming up next, something. Oh, would you like me to say that? Go ahead. I think we'll take a walk down the uh, campaign trail. Right I'm idea. in the mood for that. Okay, this is it. First, Dagwood goes to work for Blondie. Now they're killing off Superman. What's with it with these comic writers? What's next? Pogo moves in with Beetle Bailey. They've got to know killing off Superman is crossing that invisible line, that invisible line between believable superhero stuff and unbelievable TV stuff. It didn't work for Bobby Ewing. It's not going to work for Superman. Barry Mitchell's pretty mad about it all. He has some thoughts. Sans accordion this time. I'm really bummed out. The news has been so bad lately, war, famine, natural disasters, that I was especially shocked to hear they're killing off Superman. Is nothing sacred? DC Comics announced that with his November issue, the Man of Steel bites the dust. Where does that leave all the people who still have subscriptions? Maybe they'll pull a Bobby Ewing and say the whole thing was a dream. After all, the publishers also admit that death may mean something completely different to Superman than to you and me. Yeah, what? Is he condemned to work a lounge in Vegas for eternity? Come to think of it, death was a good career move for Elvis. He's worth more now than when he was alive. But Superman's special. Every adolescent boy goes through his Superman phase. Mine was around sixth grade. I devoured every comic book and watched all those George Reeves TV shows with the lousy special effects. I built and painted a Superman model. A few of us even wore the Superman emblem to school under our shirts. We'd sit and exchange knowing glances, quietly invincible. I wonder what kills old Mr. Kent. Maybe the depletion of our ozone layer has become so serious that streams of kryptonite are flooding the Earth's atmosphere. Maybe he's just real depressed that there hasn't been a legitimate phone booth for him to change in since 1965. Other comic page perennials are also going through life-altering changes. Dagwood Bumstead just quit his job at the J.C. Dithers Company after 50-odd years and is going to go to work for Blondie's catering business. Hey, Dagwood's about the same age as Superman and eats a high-fat, high-calorie diet. How come he isn't dying? I wonder what other surprises lie ahead for us. Kathy gets married. Charlie Brown finally kicks the football. Doonesbury joins the conservative right. In an uncertain world, some things just should not be tampered with. And if you say your name backwards, do we go away till the next half hour? <laughs> We never go away. <laughs> it's kind of the curse of this job. <laughs> no matter how we do it, how badly we try, we're here again for another half hour. Okay. That's it. Just asking. Won't work. You're watching World News Now. I tried it already.